Well, last time in our study through the letter to the Galatians, we learned that through faith in Christ, we're adopted as sons and daughters of God with all of the rights and privileges that come along with that, making us heirs along with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We're not just forgiven for our sins. We're, we don't just have our guilt taken away. We're not just given eternal life, but we are adopted into the very family of God as his children. Now, it's incredible that we can have our sins forgiven, that we can have our guilt taken away, that we can have eternal life, but God doesn't just make us like the angels. He makes us his very sons and daughters like Jesus. I want to pick up in Galatians 4.8 as Paul continues his uh, thought along these lines. He says, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. In other words, Paul is saying to his readers that coming into this unbelievable relationship with God through Christ, being adopted as his sons and daughters, how can you now go back to the same empty, ineffective bondage of human religion that you were in before? He says you've given up your sonship to become a slave again. You were adopted into God's family as a son or daughter, brought into the royal house, given a place at the table as a beloved child, but now for some unexplainable reason, you've chosen to go back out of the king's house, put on the servant's clothes, take residence in the servant's shack, and start working for wages as a hired hand again. Why, why, why? That's what Paul's saying. It's easy for us, I think, to hear Paul talking to the Christians in the Galatian churches of the first century about this issue, but he's talking to us in our day too. I mean, how many of us have done the same thing that they have? Instead of living as a child of the king, we have gone back to living like a slave, working for wages, trying to pay a debt that has already been paid for us. The French philosopher Voltaire made an interesting remark when he said, if there were no God, it would be necessary to invent him. Human beings have an innate need to worship. And if we don't worship the real God, we will invent a God to worship. And if we are not given the way to have a relationship with God by God himself, we will invent a way to have a relationship with God. And the sad and unfortunate truth is this, is that we create awful gods for ourselves to worship. We create awful ways to worship God, whether it's the real God or a God of our own making. The religions that we create and invent are horrible systems of bondage. This is a thrust of Paul's words. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Before coming to know the real God through Christ, you followed false gods, gods of your own making, and you put yourself into bondage. You enslaved yourself to these gods. The worship of false gods or the real God outside of Christ always results in enslavement. Why? Because these things are, as Paul says in verse 9, weak and worthless. They're weak. They have no strength. They have no power. They're worthless. They're useless. They're inadequate. They're ineffective. 
They can't really provide forgiveness for sins and the removal of our guilt before God. They can't overcome death. They can't give us eternal life. They don't have power to change us, to bring us to life spiritually, and to transform us into the likeness of Christ. And they cannot make us the sons and daughters of God. Now, although these things cannot accomplish for us what we really need and want, They delude us into thinking that they can. If we will work hard enough and long enough, we will follow, all of this stuff will follow along and come to us if we follow the rules, we perform all the rights, if we're a good boy or a good girl. So we work and we work and we work, but we don't get rewarded for our efforts ultimately. There are a few things worse than the promise of reward, and then after you have expended all of your efforts and resources to get that reward, you discover the path that you chose doesn't lead to the reward. That's what religion outside of Christ is. It's like the proverbial carrot on a stick. The carrot, the reward is dangled out in front of us always just out of reach, but close enough that we are tricked into thinking that if we will work just a little harder, we'll finally get it. But it's a big, fat lie. You will never get the carrot. You will work yourself right into the grave and never gain an inch on finally getting hold of the reward that your heart so desperately longs for. That's what religion is outside of Christ. He says in verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. This is a reference to the, pre, to the very special days that the Jews observed as part of their religion. And it could just as easily be a reference to virtually any of the religious observances that people adopt in an attempt to prove their devotion to God and earn God's favor. When the non-Jewish people in Galatia were following the pagan religions of their culture, they were carrying out all kinds of, of they were carrying out all kinds of observances in this effort to earn the favor of those gods. And now these people After coming to faith in Christ, they're carrying out all kinds of observances from the Jewish religion in an effort to earn the favor of God. Paul says to them, are you nuts? After being set free in Christ, you're now going back to being slaves to the same kind of weak and worthless stuff that you were doing before. Now granted, they were now trying to earn the favor of the real God rather than the false gods that they were following before, but they're going back to the same means and methods as before, trying to obtain salvation through their own efforts rather than trusting in the efforts of Christ done on their behalf. We've noted here before many times in our study through the Bible that it not only matters who we worship, but how we worship. Worshiping the real God in the wrong way is not any better than worshiping a false God. Verse 9, he says, But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. And this is a beautiful expression of God's active, gracious hand in our salvation. Paul points his readers back to the true gospel of Jesus Christ in this one sentence. Knowing in the Bible is more than possessing intellectual knowledge. To know someone is to enter into personal relationship with them. So Paul saying you have come to know God is another way of saying you have come into a personal relationship with God. And Paul's saying, or rather to be known by God is another way of saying, or rather God took the initiative to enter into a personal relationship with you. God is proactive rather than reactive about our salvation. He is the pursuer of us rather than us chasing after him. He's the good shepherd 
who has left the 99 to find the one lost sheep. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. God saves us rather than us saving ourselves. We know him because he first knew us and revealed himself to us. We love him because he first loved us. Tim Keller wrote, the great and central basis of Christian assurance is not how much our hearts are set on God, but how unshakably his heart is set on us. So putting it all together, verse 9 says, now that you have come into a personal relationship with God, or rather, God took the initiative to enter into a personal relationship with you, making you his sons and daughters, how can you turn back again to the same weak and worthless human ideas about how to know God that you used to follow and be enslaved by? That's the question that he's asking them. And this is not just a first century Galatian church question. It's for us too. See, if you are carrying out religious observances, whatever they are, with the belief that they will gain salvation for you or keep salvation for you, then you have fallen into the same trap that the believers in these Galatian churches have. We are saved by the grace of God alone, through faith in Christ, alone. Well, in verse 12, Paul now gets very personal with the people in the Galatian churches, speaking with them from his heart as a pastor and friend, reminding them of the love and the respect that they once shared for one another. In verse 12, he says, Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. He says, become as I am. He appeals to them to enter into this wonderful freedom that is theirs in Christ and not return to the bondage of the pagan religion or the Jewish religion. He says, I also have become as you are. When Paul first came to them, he didn't put on a I'm holier than you attitude and then try to drag them into the culture that he was from. He became like them. He put himself in their place, identifying with them, seeking to understand their lives, their culture. He sought to communicate with them in ways that they could understand. The idea that Paul is expressing here in these few words is expressed in a fuller way over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. This is an important principle for us to follow, too, when we are seeking to share about Jesus with other people. We want to communicate the unchanging eternal truth in a way that is understandable and relevant to the people that we're talking with. We don't want to ever change the message itself in an attempt to make it more acceptable to the culture, but we do want to change the way the message is communicated in an effort to be understood by the culture. To be relevant to the culture, the message is eternal and unchanging. The methods are not. We want to be culturally relevant with our methods. We want to be flexible and willing to change our method in order to become as you are, as he says here. Verse 13, 
you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of the blessing you felt? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. We're not told what this illness was that Paul had. But it was of a kind that forced him to stay in their area until he recovered. We get the impression that he wasn't even planning to stop and speak in this area on his missionary journey. But he fell sick in some way. So he had to stop there. And while he was there, he took the opportunity to then preach the gospel to them. And the Lord worked amazing miracles in their lives. Many of them believed and they became followers of Christ. But whatever Paul's ailment was, apparently it wasn't something that was easy to deal with. And we all like are trying to imagine what this might be. I'll let your imagination go wherever it will. But the people, in spite of the difficulty, the trial that his illness was, they loved him and they cared for him through it. They loved him and they respected him so much at the time that they were willing to do anything for him. He says, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me as an expression to get across this tremendous love and respect and willingness to help him that they had. But all that's changed. Their attitude toward Paul is different now. Verse 16 Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? The false teachers have been successful in turning some of the Galatians against Paul. Rather than seeing him as their friend and pastor with their best interests at heart, they are seeing Paul as an enemy, someone to shun, someone to be suspicious of, someone that they can't trust, someone that they should be afraid of now. 17, they, the false teachers, make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Paul contrasts the motives and the desires of the false teachers and his own for the Galatians. The false teachers have made much of you, he says, with the intention of winning them over to their side through flattery, telling them what they want to hear. He says they want to shut you out. The meaning is that the false teachers want to remove all other influences so that they are the sole source of information and truth for the Galatians. A key element in controlling people is the control of information that they have access to. I mean, this is easily observable in oppressive government regimes and cults. Control the information, and you have control of the people. They want to shut you out. that you may make much of them. Ultimately, it's all about the false teachers. The false teachers, they flatter you and they tell you what you want to hear to draw you in. They then subtly work to turn you against others, getting you to feel like they're the only ones that you can really trust. They isolate you and they control the information that you have access to. The information that they do give you is their own twisted version of the truth. Their control over you grows until you are then dependent upon them. And then they use you for their own selfish ends, whatever that might be. I tell you guys this all the time. Don't be gullible. Be smart. Be on your guard. Don't get sucked in by flattery and a good-looking front 
What lurks behind that pretty front door is not always good. I can't count how many times I've heard people say something like, oh, they're such nice people. I mean, they're so into family. They have all these great activities for the kids, and they seem to be so interested in me. Uh Uh-huh. Don't ever judge the soundness of a group on them making much of you. Be concerned about what they're selling in the back room. The bottle might be made of crystal, but that doesn't mean that there's not poison inside. In verse 19, he says, I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This is the heart of the true servant of Jesus. Paul's desire for them is not to gain control over them so that they will then serve his ends. His desire is to see Christ formed in them, to see Christ fully developed in them. This is the main desire of the true pastor and teacher in the church, to see Christ fully formed in the life of every person. It's all about Jesus Christ, each of us knowing him more and more fully, each of us growing more and more like him in character, each of us loving him more and more deeply. If the pastor or teacher has some other aim, then get away from that pastor or teacher. The false teachers that Paul was contending with in the Galatian churches, they were working to diminish Christ in the minds of the people. He's a good way to get started, but we have the real full path for you to draw close to God and receive salvation. They were diminishing Christ in the minds of the people, and they were growing their own importance in their minds. We know how to get you there. We know how to get you there. Christ was not the center of attention and importance in their teaching. They themselves were. And if you see that happening, then get away from that person. Let's flip over to Ephesians chapter 4 quickly. And read verse 11, where Paul describes the purpose and the function of pastors, teachers, leaders in the church. It says, in he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to see Christ formed in you, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes and wacky weird doctrines and stuff that comes through the church all the time. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. If we flip back over to Galatians 4. Beginning in verse 21, this last passage of this chapter, Paul gives an allegory drawn from an Old Testament story to illustrate the difference once more between the covenant of promise and the covenant of the law. The Jews, they proudly proclaimed that they were the descendants of Abraham. And so Paul, he strategically 
draws his example from the life of Abraham and the story of his two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. In verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. These two sons of Abraham were very different. One son, Ishmael, was born to the slave woman, Hagar. God had promised Abraham that he would give him a son. But Sarah, Abraham's wife, she had not been able to get pregnant. So in an effort to fulfill God's promise through their own work, Sarah gave her servant Hagar to Abraham to have a child through. And Ishmael is the child that resulted from that effort. The other son, Isaac, was born later to Sarah, the free woman. Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. The fact that she had a child at such a late age in her life was clearly a miracle of God. This child, Isaac, was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham years earlier that he would have a son. So these two sons have the following differences. Ishmael, born to the slave woman, is a slave himself. He is born naturally through the efforts of people trying to accomplish what God had promised he would do for them. Isaac, born to the free woman and a free person himself, he was born miraculously by God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. So verse 24, now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She's Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. So Paul elaborates further on the figurative meaning in this story attached to these two women and their children. Hagar and her son Ishmael, he says, represents this old covenant, the covenant established through the law of God given through Moses to the Jewish people. And just like Hagar and her son were slaves, he says, so the people under the old covenant are also slaves. The law and the old covenant produces slaves rather than free people. These people are slaves to the law. The continual pursuit of trying to fulfill it perfectly, yet never able to, and so never able to obtain the blessing, the reward, the salvation It's a carrot on a stick. The present Jerusalem of Paul's day, he said, represented the old covenant and the people enslaved by it. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. The Jerusalem from above, it represents the children of the free woman and the new covenant. These are the children of grace, the children of promise. Verse 27 is a quotation from Isaiah 54.1 that he applies to this allegory. He says, for it's written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. He says, the barren one, Sarah, who was not able to have children, but then very late in life, by the miracle of God, as a fulfillment of his promise, she gave birth to a son. Her children come through the promise. They come by faith rather than works. That's the point of what he's saying. Verse 28. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. If you have entered into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, then you are a child of promise like Isaac. 
You've experienced a supernatural birth and you have become heirs with Christ. You are the sons and daughters of God. Verse 29. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. The persecution that Paul's referring to in these verses is that part in the story in Genesis 21 where Ishmael was mocking Isaac and then Hagar and Ishmael were driven from the family. Well, in a similar way, Christians, the Isaacs, were being persecuted at that time by the Jews, the Ishmaels. In verse 31, finally, the last verse of the chapter, so, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. How do we become a son or daughter of God? How do we receive salvation? How do we become an heir of Jesus Christ? By believing and trusting in the promise of God. The righteous live by faith. For those who believe the promise, trusting in the accomplishment of Jesus Christ, rather than their own good works, their own accomplishments, their own efforts, God counts as righteous. Those who are trying to be their own savior, trying to be good enough, are chasing a carrot on a stick. You will never get the carrot. You will work yourself into the grave and never gain an inch on finally getting hold of the reward that your heart desperately longs for. You want to know God. You want to be his child. You want your guilt taken away. You want to have eternal life. But that cannot be accomplished by chasing the carrot on the stick. By working and working and working and just trying harder. A religion of good works can't provide forgiveness for your sins. It can't remove your guilt before holy God. It can't overcome death. It can't give you eternal life. It doesn't have the power to change you, to bring you to life spiritually, to transform you into the likeness of Christ. It can't make you the son or daughter of God. These things can only be obtained through the promise of God in Christ received in faith. In Christ, you have everything Finally, the (laughs) punchline. If you've been following along through our study through the letter of Galatians, hopefully you're going, well, this sounds like it's the same message being shared with us every time as we go through this. I hope you think that, because it is. Because that's exactly what Paul's doing. He, he just keeps banging his fist. Stop trying to be a Jew. Stop trying to follow your old religious ways. Receive Christ. Trust in the promise of God in Christ. That is the only way to eternal life. No religion of our own invention and making is going to get us anything worth having. Only Christ. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for our brother Paul, who gave his life to the church.
to share these important truths with us, to remind us of things that we must never forget. It is beyond our comprehension that we would become the sons and daughters of God. But that is what we are in Christ. And in Christ alone. Touch your people with this truth this week, Lord. Help us to take hold of that and never let go of it. We're your kids, your sons and daughters. We've been given a place at the table of the king. May we never put that servant coat back on and walk out that door and start working again to try to earn our way into a house that's already ours. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen.